I'm going to get started. Alright, so today we're actually talking about the calcium story, which is calcium supplement. And the reason I was interested in this story was that it actually is quite topical in the newspaper and the Toronto Star uh, and Globe and Mail as well. There was actually several articles which a lot of patients saw and actually came in to talk to uh, doctors about. So in this, it was actually about just about a month ago in the Globe and Mail. This was the, the headline: Calcium tablets risk could outweigh benefits. And what they said is that you know there's a growing body of evidence that suggests that calcium supplements may actually do more harm than good. Just about the same time, the Toronto Star actually published a similar article, Bone Building Calcium Cells Increased Heart Attack Risk. And in that, they note that a lot of people are taking, a lot of postmenopausal women are taking uh, calcium supplements to ward off uh, osteoporosis, but that, that may actually increase their risk of heart attack and strokes. And what they say is maybe we should reconsider the near universal uh, supplementation of calcium in our diet. So that started me thinking whether or not we should do it because I think about a lot about calcium anyway because we use it a lot for our renal patients, but I'm not really going to talk about renal patients in this. So really, if you go back to why we recommend calcium, it's actually the evidence is actually kind of scarce. Most of it is actually just kind of expert opinion thinking that, well, bone is mostly calcium. Therefore, eating calcium must be good for you. And that's pretty well all the evidence that's available. Um, people also say, well, the recommended, recommended daily allowance is about 1,200 milligrams per day. And since most people don't take the 1,200 milligrams per day, we should probably take supplements. Well, if you think about the recommended daily allowance of calcium, um, you might ask yourself, how do they come up with this? And you might think, oh, well, you know, they probably did a bunch of studies, you know, people in white coats and big brains, they probably did lots of these studies to come up with this number. Well, unfortunately, though, you'd probably be wrong. The, the way they came up with the recommended daily allowance is actually they took the average requirement, so the average amount, and they added two standard deviations of it. So that if calcium intake falls along a normal curve, you would be at the 95th percentile, that is 1,200 milligrams is roughly more than about 95% of the general population takes. And that's that's how they came up with this recommended daily allowance. So, really, when you think about it, it's a little bit of a circular logic because the recommended amount of calcium that you should be taking is set at a level that 95% of women actually don't need. And then, you recommend supplements, you berate people for not taking it. But you already knew that 95% of people don't take it. So, the 1,200 milligrams is not that good um, a level. In fact, if you were to sing, apply the same sort of logic to other circumstances, for instance, you'd say that, okay, well, a recommended height of a man is six foot three, and the recommended height of a woman is five foot nine. So we should really be prescribing growth hormones to the general population. Well, clearly that's a ridiculous statement. Or the recommended weight of a man is 260 pounds, and the recommended weight of a woman is 230 pounds. Again, a ridiculous uh, sort of suggestion, but yet that's the same sort of logic that goes into this recommended daily allowance of calcium in 1200 milligrams. So uh, let's go back a little bit then and think about the evolutionary biology of humans. So you know, of course, that humans have lived most of their lives without osteoporosis, and most of the world's population, being lactose intolerant, uh, really doesn't have much dairy intake and has much lower levels of calcium. Early humans didn't have calcium supplements, they didn't eat oyster shells, and they didn't eat, uh, drink milk for the most part. Uh, most of the world actually has far less than 500 milligrams per day. So, for 99% of human existence, we didn't drink cow's milk. You know, we're Neanderthals or whatever. Uh, and if we nearly needed cow's milk to survive, we wouldn't really have survived and prospered. So it seems strange that we're now saying that you need so much calcium, otherwise it's strange that most of the world's people haven't yet dissolved into like boneless heaps of protoplasm, something like this. Because that's what we're saying, you need to take the calcium, otherwise you're going to look like this stuff. Um, mammals, for instance, 
uh, are, are defined by certain things. They're air breathing, they have hair, and they have mammary, mammary glands for suckling young. That is, they drink milk. However, if you look at, there's a total number of mammalian species, it's 5,676. But the total that I have to drink milk after weaning is only one. So, if you really needed to drink all that milk and take all that calcium, you would expect that there would be 5,675 osteoporotic species in the world. There'd be osteoporotic cows and osteoporotic mooses. But in fact, there's only one osteoporotic species of mammal. So that's a little bit strange, too. So we can think about it in terms of a global sense, because global calcium intake actually varies quite dramatically. So for instance, Japan, which is a first world country as well, has very low rates of calcium intake. They don't drink much milk and so on. So they have about 400 milligrams per day. So according to what we've all been taught, you would expect that there would be very high rates of osteoporotic fractures in Japanese women. Unfortunately, you'd also be wrong. In fact, the rates of osteoporotic fractures in Japan are actually two and a half times lower than they, than they are in the United States. If you look in Africa, for instance, they have, the women have very, very low calcium intakes, 350 milligrams per day, uh, mostly intake through vegetables, and there's virtually no osteoporosis, despite the fact that they have an average of 10 babies uh, per woman. And what they find is that osteoporosis is in fact very, very rare until they emigrate to the United States and start taking all this calcium and protein-rich diet. So that's a little strange too because we, that doesn't fit in with our whole concept. In Greece, the average uh, milk consumption actually from 1961 to 1977 doubled. So you might expect that osteoporosis would fall in half. In fact, the osteoporosis, as they drank more milk and took more calcium, the osteoporosis rates double. In Hong Kong, you doubled your intake of dairy products from 1966 to 1989, uh, but what you found was that the osteoporosis rates didn't drop at all. In fact, they are triple what they used to be. In Venezuela and Chile, for instance, they have much, much lower rates of milk consumption, and yet they have threefold lower rates of hip fracture. In China, although things are starting to change, the average milk consumption is much, much lower. It's 8 kilograms per person versus an American woman of 254. And the hip, rate, hip fracture rate is six times lower. So even within the same country, because you might say, okay, well, there's differences within the country. Even within the same country, you know that Mexican Americans and blacks have the lowest intake of milk amongst all Americans, yet they have two times a lower rate of osteoporotic fractures. South Africa, if you compare the whites to the blacks, the whites take five times as much calcium as the blacks, and yet they have nine times more hip fractures. But that doesn't make any sense. If calcium was truly the most important thing for bone health, as we all have been taught to think, these would not all be true. So you have to reconcile the facts that the United States has one of the highest rates of calcium consumption, yet one of the highest rates of osteoporosis. In fact, if you were to look at the group of people with the very highest rate of osteoporosis in the world, that would be the native Eskimo or Inuit. And they actually have 2,000 milligrams of calcium a day. They take a lot of calcium per day. It doesn't protect them at all. In fact, it puts them at higher risk. So, if you think about the calcium intake and how much you should be taking, you have to consider that the countries with the highest calcium intake have the highest rates of osteoporosis. The countries with the highest dairy intake have the highest rates of fracture. And the countries with the highest bone mineral density have the highest rates of hip fracture as well. If you were to graph it, you can see that as you take more calcium, as your calcium level goes up, your hip fracture incidence also goes up, which is, again, contrary to what they've been all telling you. It doesn't go down in the least. If you knew nothing else about calcium, why would you want to put yourself on this side of the graph? 
and yet that's what we've all done. We've put ourselves at 1,200 milligrams. We've put ourselves all in the high-risk category, okay? If you were to look at it, somewhere around 450, 500 milligrams of calcium per day, as you go above that, you're getting more and more and more osteoporosis and hip fractures. If you are to look at heart outcomes, osteoporosis mortality by country, number one, two, and three, Denmark, Norway, and Australia, are all very high calcium intake, very high dairy intake. Canada and the United States I put in there, just for comparison, you can see by the time you get to Japan, with about 400, 500 milligrams per day, your osteoporosis mortality is barely one-tenth of what you get in Canada. And yet, we all think that we should be taking not only this amount, but even more calcium, even to get up to these levels of calcium. From an epidemiologic standpoint, that doesn't make any sense at all. So in contradistinction to uh, dairy and calcium intake, there actually is a very strong link between animal protein intake and osteoporosis. Um, milk, for instance, take, contains a lot of calcium, but at the same time, it's actually quite high in animal protein, such that we can calculate that if you're to double your protein intake, the urinary calcium loss is increased by about 50%. And if you go back to uh, basic physiology, you can kind of understand why. This is a quote by T. Colin Campbell, who wrote the China study. And he said that the correlation between animal protein intake and fracture rates really is as strong as that between lung cancer and smoking. He's actually the son of a dairy farmer, and he wound up changing his whole lifestyle, and he actually stopped uh, drinking dairy and taking dairy products. And the reason is all due to acid buffering. So this is all fairly well-established uh, physiology. What happens is that animal proteins, uh, as opposed to vegetable proteins, actually have several sulfur-containing amino acids. So they're actually acidic. So it's an acid load. The short-term buffering occurs with carbonic acid and you blow it out in the lungs. But the long-term buffering of an acid load actually occurs in the bones. So it actually causes your H+, which is the hydrogen ion, which is the acid, to be taken up by the bones. And what happens is that you have to actually dissolve your calcium because you have calcium carbonate and calcium phosphate so the calcium carbonate dissociates, it becomes carbonic acid, the pho uh, calcium phosphate dissociates, that becomes phosphoric acid, the phosphoric acid gets excreted, and your urine also excretes the calcium. So you're actually leaching the, bone, the, the calcium out of your bones when you're taking a high animal protein intake. So if you look at uh, up to date, what they say is one consequence of bone buffering is that acid loading directly increases increases calcium release from bones in urinary calcium excretion. And in fact, they also note in up-to-date that there is a direct uh, decreased osteoblastic and increased osteoplastic function demonstrated from an acid load. Again, so you're decreasing the uh, synthetic, uh, the osteoblast, which uh, synthesize these bones, and you increase the osteoclast, which break down the bones. So the problem, of course, with cow's milk is that it's very, very high in animal protein. So it actually has three times the amount of protein in human milk, which is why you don't give it straight to babies. And it's actually designed for calves who, you know, they grow from about 100 pounds to 800 pounds. They need a lot of protein. So the cow's milk is very, very high in protein. The problem is maybe too high for what we need. In fact, even if you look at the, the, the World Health Organization, uh, what they say is that the accumulated data indicate that the adverse effect of protein, particularly animal but not vegetable protein, might outweigh the positive benefits of calcium intake on calcium balance. That is, when you take a lot of animal protein, you lose a lot of calcium in your urine. And that all comes directly out of the bone. So the epidemiology can only take us so far because there's a lot of differences, truthfully, between countries, right? There's genetic differences, there's lifestyle differences, there's food choices, there's all kinds of problems. So you, you actually have to look at the, the evidence, okay? So um, this is a very interesting study done by a little-known university uh, called Harvard, the American Journal of Public Health in 1997. So this is a huge study, Nurses' Health Study, 77,000 people, 1,000 women, uh, age 30 to 55. And what they did was they sent them dietary questionnaires. 
1982, 84, 86, and they followed them for 12 years. And what they expected to find is what we all thought was that as you increase your calcium intake, you are going to have less osteoporosis, you're going to have less fractures. What did they actually find? Well, it turns out that as you increase your total dietary calcium above about 450 milligrams, you will actually double, double your rate of hip fractures. In fact, if you look at it in terms of dairy calcium, milk, as you go up higher and higher, you get a stepwise increase in the amount of hip fractures that you get. However, if you look at the non-dairy calcium, which of course, remember, doesn't contain the high animal protein, as you go up on non-dairy calcium, you don't see that same effect. At the high levels of non-dairy calcium, you get the same rate of hip fracture. So this is contrary to everything that we knew about it. Um, in fact, you can also look at the milk, how much milk they take in, which is not as comprehensive as dairy, but you can see that if, as you drink less and less, as you drink more and more milk, I should say, your risk of hip fracture goes up and up, such that if you're drinking a lot of milk, your risk is about 45% higher, even though that's not statistically significant. They actually did another follow-up study to that, which was an 18-year follow-up to that same study, uh, which they kind of updated everything, and they didn't see quite the same effect. You do see a, uh, the increase, as you increase your dietary calcium, you can see that you still get no protection against hip fracture, although you don't seem to get that excess amount of hip fracture. Nevertheless, the calcium doesn't seem to be protective in any uh, any significant way against osteoporosis or hip fractures. If you look at vitamin D, in contrast, you can see as you get more and more vitamin D, you get less and less hip fractures. Your, your hazard ratio keeps going down such that you only have 63% of the risk at the highest level of vitamin D intake. If you look at dark fish, which of course contains a lot of vitamin D, as you take more and more dark fish, you get less and less hip fractures. That is highly significant. Um, in April of 2011, they looked, the, they, they looked at all the studies looking at um, milk intake and the risk of hip fractures in men and women. And again, which basically shows what we've been talking about, which is that you can take six studies, almost 200,000 women to 3,500 hip fractures, and what you find is that you get no kind of protection by drinking more milk. It doesn't seem to protect you. And then, the studies are much less. You can see there's much less hip fractures, so there's wider confidence interval. But again, not significant. It doesn't seem to have any kind of protective effect. So again, that's the cohort study, and that's very good in that you get very long follow-up. But it's not a randomized control trial, which is really our best evidence uh, to date. So really, what do the randomized control trials tell us? Well, there's been a few, because there's been a lot of interest in calcium and osteoporosis. So the first one came out about six years ago, uh, published in the BMJ, British Medical Journal, and it was uh, done in 3,300 women, 70 or older, with risk factors for, risk factors for a hip fracture, and they were randomized to uh, calcium supplementation, 1,000 milligrams, plus vitamin D, or nothing. They were not allowed to take non-protocol calcium supplements, and they followed them up for 24 months. And what did they find? Well, they found that the calcium basically didn't do anything. At the end of the trial, at 24 months, there was really no difference in the rate of hip fracture between the calcium supplement and not. If you look at all the odds ratio, it's pretty close to unity, which is 1.0. So there's no protective effect, there's no detrimental effect. So their conclusion at the end of this was that they found no evidence that calcium and vitamin D supplementation reduces the risk of clinical fractures in women. Another study published in The Lancet very shortly after, May of 2005, about 5,292 patients, again, 70 years or older, randomized to vitamin D plus a gram of calcium and followed up between two and five years. <coughs> again, you can see from their results that really, it doesn't really matter whether you look at all hip fractures or just hip fractures. There's no difference when you take the calcium or when you don't take the calcium. 
it's all the same. You can look at whatever subgroup you want to look at. You know, whether it's older, whether it's men or female, it doesn't matter. Nobody benefits from calcium supplementation. So again, if you look at the combination hazard ratio, 1.01. .01, so basically not significant. There's no benefit. A third trial published in the Archives of Internal Medicine, 2006, looked at 1,460 women, randomized again to calcium uh, versus placebo and five-year follow-up. Um, if you look at the, 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 the things, they, they actually are not significantly different. So again, no protective effect. So a third trial showing exactly the same thing, the hazard ratio, not significant. So supplementation with calcium carbonate tablets supplying 1,200 milligrams per day is ineffective as a public health intervention in preventing clinical fractures. So that takes us, uh, oh, but the important part of this trial was they actually noted for the first time that they actually had an increase in incident ischemic heart disease. Okay, it was diagnosed in slightly more calcium group versus the placebo, although it was not significant. The uh, hazard ratio was 1.12, but it was not statistically significant, but they do point it out in their study for the first time. Which takes us to kind of the trial to end all trials for calcium. This is this New England, trial, New England Journal of Medicine trial, which was published in 2006. And it was a huge trial, 36,000 women. And they followed up for seven years. The problem with this trial is that they randomized a group to calcium and vitamin D, so it ran <coughs> calcium. However, patients were allowed to take their own calcium if they wanted to. So even in the placebo group, you had a number of people who are taking calcium because we believe the story so strongly that calcium is good for you. We believe this so strongly, we allowed them to take it. So it kind of, uh, but it is what it is. This is what the trial showed. If you look at the bone mineral density, yes, you can see that in the kit there was a little bit le uh, greater bone mineral density. But if you look at the total spine or the whole body, there was no difference. So, you know, they made a big deal about it, but Really, if the whole body bone mineral density is unchanged, that means you took some calcium out of somewhere else and stuck it in your hip. I'm not sure that how, how significant that really is. And this was their final results. And remember, this is a humongous trial. At the end of it, what they did was they, they looked at hip fractures, vertebral fractures, total fractures, and lower arm and wrist fractures. There was actually no difference in any of those groups. No benefit the calcium. This is over seven years, 36,000 women, and they couldn't find any kind of benefit. If you look at total fractures, it's about as close to one as you can get, so 0.96, so no benefit at all. However, what happened was that when you get these negative trials, they start slicing and dicing the data, so they try to find some way to get a positive result. So they did find that if you exclude the follow-up time for participants six months after non-adherence, then you could get a positive result in the hip fractures only. Not, no difference in vertebral fractures, arm fractures, or total fractures, but maybe a little bit of difference. And uh, you, you'll, you'll note that, of course, first of all, this is not pre-specified. Second of all, why would you exclude them six months after non-adherence? Why not 12 months? Why not immediately? Why not three months? And the answer, of course, is that six months is when you get the positive result, right? So the follow-up time is much shorter. And also, it's, not a, it's no longer a randomized group because you've introduced um, systemic bias by you know, eliminating certain people. So nevertheless, that's what they published. If you look at the hip fracture rate more closely, uh, it's 0.14% versus 0.16%, so no difference. There's no reduction in any of the other fractures, vertebral fractures, arm fractures, or total fractures. But you did get this small kind of increase in bone mineral density at the hip, but not anywhere else. If you exclude the non-compliant patients, yes, you get a, a good result in the hip, 0.1% versus 0.14%, so slightly less hip fractures, but no differences anywhere else, and no difference in total fractures, which means that basically what you're saying is that you have less hip fractures, but more fractures somewhere else to make up for it, which I'm not sure is that significant. Uh, in terms of safety, the important thing was that they did find an adverse effect of the calcium, they do see a lot more kidney stones. So the hazard ratio is about 1.17 or 17%, more likely to have kidney stones. But there was no difference in cardiovascular events, which is very reassuring. There is actually no difference in cancer rates, because cancer, they had thought that 
calcium perhaps may be actually beneficial in terms of reducing cancer rates, but unfortunately they didn't find anything like that. So the bottom line really was that there was no benefit in any kind of fracture. Uh, when you slice and dice the data, you can come up with perhaps uh, something that you might think is significant for compliant patients. However, the absolute benefit is really, really very small. So even if you're to believe those results, you have to treat 10,000 women for seven years in order to prevent four hip fractures. Okay, that's your absolute best case scenario. Uh, in the baseline scenario, you'd have to treat 5,000 women for seven years for one hip fracture, to prevent one hip fracture. And then you're going to get a fracture somewhere else because, you know, the total number of fractures was not reduced. So what they said was that the, even though the statistically null primary effect argues against recommending universal calcium, they say this provides evidence of a positive effect of calcium with vitamin D on bone health. My question is, what kind of benefit are you looking at? What benefit was there? There was no benefit at all. Your bone mineral density was unchanged, your hip fracture incidence was you know, unchanged, your total fracture was unchanged, and you had more kidney stones. What kind of benefit are you talking about? <laughs> but nevertheless, that's what they thought. Really, they, there was no benefit whatsoever to this, but they believed it so strongly they're going to argue for it anyway. And what they said was that, well, it improves the numbers, right? It improves the bone mineral density. We all know that medicine is about treating the numbers and not the patients, right? Um, that's what they were treating, the bone mineral density. They weren't looking at the patients. And you can also feel good that you're treating pe people with something because it's better than treating with nothing. The doctors feel a lot better even though the patient feels worse, right? <laughs> so undaunted by all this negative evidence, we continue to prescribe calcium for a quote-unquote bone health even though we know with virtual certainty that the calcium supplements were completely useless. Every single trial that you did, every single randomized trial that you did, showed no benefit. At least they weren't harmful, which was the main, you know, the only good thing they, they said about it, right? So as a result, all women, including like my mother and my mother-in-law, everybody got put on calcium, and we kept them on calcium, despite all the negative evidence. And then people started to think, well, why is this excess calcium intake so dangerous? Well. The excess calcium can't stay in the bones. That is, if you give bones more calcium than they can use, they'll use whatever they can use, and that'll be about it. It's like if you build a house, and you need one truckload of bricks, but you give them five, and you have bricks in your living room and stuff, is your house any stronger? Not really. The bones just can't use it. And it's got to go somewhere else, right? There's only a few places you can put it. So you can excrete it in the urine, and therefore you get kidney stones. We already know that. But the worry is that they can actually also be taken up by the blood vessels, which gives you faster calcification. Now if you think about it, the 24-hour urinary calcium, the normal amount is about 100 to 300 milligrams a day. If you're a good girl, you'd be taking 1,200 milligrams per day. Where is all that extra calcium going? That's a real concern, because over the last two decades, what we've realized is that there's a lot of problems with coronary artery calcification. So basically, it's a, it's a predictor of coronary events. I don't know that it's causal, but it's a predictor. Uh, the calcium phosphate pre precipitates in these diseased calcium uh, coronary arteries, and it's by a mechanism very similar to active bone formation. <laughs> that is, it's not simply passive deposition of calcium, but it's actually an active uptake. So if you have active uptake in your bones, you might worry that there'll be active uptake in your coronary arteries too. So it seems to occur exclusively in these uh, atherosclerotic arteries. You don't find them in normal vessel walls. But the more extensive the coronary calcification, the more likely that a coronary event will occur. And that is, you know, that is not of, uh, up to dispute. That's fairly well proven. The question is what, what role the calcium intake plays in that. So the first kind of hints that things were going to not be so good for calcium came in 2008 by this fellow Paul uh, from, I think he's either Australia or New Zealand. So he had done a study looking at bone health. 1,400 women postmenopausal, and they randomized them to calcium citrate versus placebo. Uh, 
Um, it was two tablets of calcium citrate versus placebo, and the placebo group were not allowed to take any calcium supplements. And there was a pre-specified secondary outcome of coronary uh, events. And they actually thought that this would actually decrease events. Unfortunately, what they actually found was the rate of heart attack was like double. Okay, 31 heart attacks versus 15. The rate of stroke was about 60% higher rate of stroke. And then the rate of stroke, sudden death, or MI was significantly higher. If you were to exclude non-compliant patients, the numbers would be even worse. And the, this is what it looks like on a graph. So as you take the calcium, the rate of heart attacks continuously goes up. This is it for cumulative incidence of uh, myocardial infarction. This is it for strokes. So, and uh, this is the calcium group. You can see that they have worse uh, rate, um, results in terms of strokes. Um, and this is the same thing in a table form. In their discussion, they, they note several points. One is that they use calcium citrate, which is highly bioavailable, as opposed to calcium carbonate, which they used, which was used in that gigantic Women's Health Initiative. Uh, they did not use, uh, allow the non-protocol use of supplements, that is the placebo group were not getting calcium. And this really echoes the finding of that other group from, uh, that, that had shown that increased rate of uh, myocardial infarction with calcium supplementation. So the problem, of course, with calcium supplements is that it acutely elevates your calcium. So, you know, we're not built to eat oyster shell, so when you take this pill, which is mostly ground up oyster shell. It's a lot of calcium to take at one time. It's not bound with anything else. Your calcium levels can go very high and then back down. Uh, and the worry about that, of course, is that where's all that calcium going to go? It's got to go somewhere. And if your levels go up very high very quickly, it could be taken up in the coronary arteries. That's the worry. Um, this is an effect you don't see with the, the dietary calcium. And it may actually accelerate the, the vascular calcification in addition to increasing the so-called bone mineral density. They also note that calcium intakes were associated with vascular calcifications and brain lesions in the MRI and also in dialysis patients. You can see that higher calcium intakes is associated with higher mortality and vascular calcification. Um, so he was really worried about this whole idea so he actually did some further studies, uh, which was published in the British Medical Journal, looking at the same sort of thing. So he took other studies, and he ex ex the first study he did, he excluded trials that had vitamin D, because the vitamin D may be good for you, which may counteract the effect of the calcium, which may be bad for you. So he took uh, 11 studies, uh, 12,000 patients, and he looked at all the trials that had calcium only, without the vitamin D, versus uh, placebo. And what did he find? Well, if you look at the same sort of heart outcomes, my, uh, heart attacks, strokes, and sudden death, you can see that there's about a 20% increased risk when you take the calcium. 20% higher risk of heart attack, stroke, or death. This is the, the graph for death. You can see that these are the individual trials, of course. You can see again what you want to see, which is that if you look at MIs, most of the data actually shows risk with calcium supplementation. But they weren't big enough, and they weren't powered for cardiovascular events. When you combine them all, you can see that there actually is a higher risk of heart attack predominantly. If you look at the strokes, there is higher, but it's not significant. And it's predominantly myocardial infarction. When you combine them all, it's also higher. There is a slightly higher risk of death, but again, not statistically significant. So, from there, he said, well, you know, we have to be careful with calcium supplements, but at the same time, we had this really big uh, trial, the Women's Health Initiative, which said that calcium supplements were safe. So, yes, they weren't useful, but they were at least safe. So, he looked at it, and he tried to reanalyze that to try and see whether there, it actually was safe. And he said, well, the problem with that was, of course, that 54% of women we're already taking calcium. So you're in the placebo group, you're not supposed to be taking calcium, but you're taking calcium anyway because, again, it's been out there that you have to take calcium, right? The more calcium you take, the better. So a lot of people were taking it. So what he did was he tried to look at the people who were not taking calcium 
and he tried to see whether or not taking calcium was actually harmful. And he had four pre-specified um, endpoints, heart attack, revascularization, coronary heart disease, death, and stroke. And what did he find? If you look at the patients that don't have any use of personal calcium, you find the same 20% risk, 20% increased risk of heart attacks once you start taking calcium supplements. Uh, this is the data there. You can see that for MIs, the, the p-value is quite significant at 0.05. And here's a really interesting thing, is that it doesn't really matter how much calcium you take to see. As soon as you start going up above this threshold of about 500 milligrams a day, which is one calcium supplement, you have an increased risk. That is, it seems that 500 milligrams is just too much. So as soon as you start taking it, zero supplements to one supplement, you already get an increased risk with the MIs. You see the same uh, thing in stroke. As soon as you get take any supplements, you can see that there's definite harm. If you can combine the endpoints, you see the same thing. MIs and stroke will show you the same result. And this was actually the trial that was uh, commented on in those uh, articles in the newspapers. So you see that all the trials basically show an increased risk of heart attack and an increased risk of uh, stroke, but when you combine them all, it is highly significant, 1.16, so about a 20% increase, 15 to 20% increased risk of heart attack and stroke with calcium supplements. And again, this is it in a graphical form, you can see higher risk of heart attack, higher risk of stroke, as well as combined. The funny part about this article in the Toronto Star was that they actually had it wrong. They said the bone building calcium pills increase your heart attack risk, but they shouldn't have said that. They should have said that. actually said the fracture inducing calcium pills <laughs> increase your heart attack risk. Like, we already knew it didn't work. Now it's just harmful. So, even if you look at the guidelines of osteoporosis, so this was the osteoporosis guidelines that were put out in October of 2010. What they um, note is that there's a paradigm shift focused, from, uh, focused on preventing fragility fractures rather than just low bone marrow density, which means prior to 2010, they're basically focused on treating the numbers and not the patient. So uh, now they've changed, which is probably a good thing. And this is what it says about calcium, and this is really all it says about calcium. There is controversy about both the efficacy of calcium supplementation for reducing fractures and the potential adverse effects of high-dose supplementation. Later on, they say that high-dose calcium supplementation may increase the risk of renal calculi and cardiovascular events. And what's important is that that's really all it says about calcium. The only part that you can see in the guidelines about calcium is lumped into this uh, basic bone health, 1,200 milligrams a day calcium diet and supplement. And that's based on the old idea at 1,200 milligrams a day is your recommended daily allowance. You should be getting it for your bones. But that's really all it says. What it does not say about calcium, it does not say to prescribe calcium to everybody and their mother. It does not say that supplements are useful to reduce mortality. It does not say that supplements prevent fractures. And it does not say supplements are even safe. Those are all the things it doesn't say about calcium. And this is a pill that everybody's taking. So really, what's happening <laughs> is that the guidelines, you know, they go blah, blah, blah about all this other stuff. You have to actually read between the lines in the small print to see what they actually think about calcium. They say, we're not really sure about calcium. It's probably not useful and actually harmful. That's what they really say, but you actually have to think about it and dig, dig, dig to find out that you shouldn't be using calcium. What they really should have said is said it out loud, right? Hey, Bozo the Clown, stop using the calcium. It's completely useless. We know that. The only question is how harmful it is. Further, they should have said, hey, Bozo the Clown, don't drink so much milk. It's probably increasing your rate of bone loss. And they actually increase your rate of hip fractures. Which gets us to the next topic of milk. Um, there's some actually controversial data about cancer in milk. Um, in some places they think that calcium intake is good for preventing cancer, milk intake is good for preventing cancer. The problem with milk, of course, is that it's actually very high in all kinds of growth factors. 
because it's designed for babies. So it's fine if you're a baby, you need growth factors. If you're an adult, the growth factors are not good for you. The IGF-1, or insulin-like growth factor 1, is very bad for you. It's bad for your coronary arteries, and it probably promotes the growth of cancer cells, because those are the cells that are growing. And it turns out by coincidence that human and bovine IGF-1 are actually identical. Uh, and these are a list of growth factors, a partial list, uh, that are found in milk. So you can see that they actually have a lot of growth factors because, again, it's designed for babies. So initially we thought perhaps calcium or milk may decrease your colon cancer rate. Um, but there was a study where they looked at a 65-year follow-up of this uh, so-called boy or cohort. Uh, published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2007. So between 1937 and 39, there was about 5,000 children in England and Scotland. They participated in the study of family food consumption. And then they looked back and they went through the registry of the National Health Service and looked how many people had cancer. And the problem was that the high childhood total dairy intake was associated with a near tripling in the odds of colorectal cancer. That is, your odds ratio is 2.9, highly statistically significant. As you take more calcium, you may triple your rate of colon cancer. If you look at ovarian cancer, it, the lactose is cleaved in the body to galactose and glucose, and it's thought that the galactose may actually increase your risk of ovarian cancer due to the direct toxicity on the ovarian germ cells and it causes the gonadotropin levels to increase to stimulate the proliferation of the ovarian epithelium and may increase your risk of ovarian cancer. So the link was first postulated in 1989 and in, uh, they, they did a meta-analysis of these studies in uh, 2006 published in the International Journal of Cancer and what they found was that the relative risk per glass of milk that you take is about 1.13 13% increased incidence of ovarian cancer per glass of milk that you take per day. So their conclusion, looking at all the studies available, is that prospective cohort studies support the hypothesis that high intakes of dairy food and lactose may increase the risk of ovarian cancer. Uh, another study in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2004, a prospective cohort study, 61,000 Swedish women uh, they assessed their diets between 1987 and 1990, and what they, they followed them for 13 and a half years. So again, if you look at the high intake of dairy, high intake of milk as a dairy product, double your weight to ovarian cancer. And also a significant uh, correlation between milk and lactose. So their data indicates that high intakes of lactose and dairy products, particularly milk, are associated with an increased risk of serous ovarian cancer. You look at prostate cancer, the EPIC study, which was a uh, huge, huge European uh, nutritional study, um, published just you know, six months ago. So 23 centers in 10 countries, almost more than actually, more than half a million participants over 10 years. So the largest study of nutrition and health ever. This is their conclusion about prostate cancer. High intake of dairy protein calcium from dairy products and high serum concentration of IGF-1 were associated with an increased risk of, of prostate cancer. So even if you don't believe me, you can go to the Harvard School of Public Health. What they're saying is that milk has a possible increased risk of ovarian cancer, a probable increased risk of prostate cancer, and there's no good evidence that consuming more than one serving of milk per day, in addition to a reasonable diet, which will provide about 300 milligrams of calcium, will reduce fracture rate. Further on, they say that calcium-only supplements do not protect against fractures and may, in fact, increase your risk. Taking calcium-only supplements may possibly increase the risk of heart attacks. Another reason to avoid. Another reason to avoid, and this is the pill that we've been giving to everybody. And that's the website if you want to look at it. It's a very interesting article on uh, harvard.edu. So, again, if you think about it, step back and think about it, you'd say, okay, so drinking milk may increase my risk of fractures, 
may cause me osteoporosis because of the high dairy intake. It'll possibly increase my risk of ovarian cancer and probably increase my risk of prostate cancer. So what good is it? The tagline, of course, for milk is that it does a body good, but I don't see any good it does that anyway. Yes, you need it when you're a baby, but you certainly don't need cow's milk, and you certainly don't need it when you're an adult. All it does is harm, harm, harm. So why do we really believe in the power of milk? It's because the American Dairy Association is a very powerful and well-organized group. It's a huge advertising budget. You see it on TV all the time. And they're able to use the school system to instill the messages in kids for the last, like, 50 years that milk is good for you. It's not that good for you. Also, Iowa is very important in the U.S. electoral politics, so you get the, a couple of lobbies which become very strong. You get the corn lobby, which gives us good things like high fructose uh, corn syrup, and the dairy lobby, which gives us milk. So they, of course, want to support their interests and convince us to drink more milk. You might think, okay, well, I can go to the American Dietetic Association, because they are, you know, what they think of themselves as a source of healthy nutritional information. Well, if you go to their annual report, what you find is that they get almost $3 million from their corporate sponsors. And if you go to the highest level of corporate sponsors, you'll find companies with such good nutrition as Coca-Cola, <laughs> and Pepsi, Unilever, General Mills, the National Dairy Council, and Mars Bar, you know, that nutritional supplement that everybody needs. It doesn't make sense. It's like the American Heart Association, if they took sponsorship, from Philip Morris or something. It'd be ridiculous. It'd be, they'd get laughed out of the country, but the American Dietetic Association still takes money from them. How can you take money from them? If you're recommending to the dietitian, to the children, and to the general population. So really, if you think about how much calcium is in milk, uh, you can look at different, different uh, foods, and you can see that arugula, watercress, spinach, broccoli, cabbage, they're actually fairly good. So milligrams per 100 calories, you can see that whole milk falls slightly less than cabbage, that other powerhouse we all think of, the calcium <laughs> powerhouse. It's ridiculous. Milk doesn't have that much calcium when you compare it to these other leafy green vegetables. So why on earth would we believe that it's impossible to get sufficient calcium except through dairy? The, the only way to get 1,200 milligrams of calcium is to pound back the milk, which is clearly unhealthy. Epidemiologic evidence shows it, the randomized evidence shows it, randomized clinical trials show it. So what about children? You might say, okay, children really need calcium. That might be reasonable, except when you look at the studies. So if you look at the Journal of Pediatrics, they followed 80 women over 10 years. What their conclusion at the end of it was that dairy calcium intakes were not significantly associated with bone gain or bone strength. So dairy or calcium intake is not important. What is important? Physical exercise is the predominant determinant. Um, in 2005, this, this author, Lenu, looked at 58 studies, 58 different studies, looking at the relationship between milk, dairy products, and calcium intake. And her conclusion at the end of these 58 studies is that the vast majority of controlled trials of dairy supplementation show that increases in total dietary calcium are not correct are not correlated with or a predictor of bone mineral density or fracture rate. That is, the calcium intake had nothing to do with it. What was important? Physical activity. Physical activity is very important for the development of bone strength. Calcium and milk? No. Not important at all. So, in essence, what we've been saying all along is that Mother Nature has made a mistake, but fortunately, we are smarter than her. And we know how to correct this by giving calcium and oyster shell to everybody. Every mammalian species, including our own, avoids drinking milk after weaning, but we're so much smarter than Mother Nature, so we're gonna, we're gonna change all this. Well, that's clearly nonsense, clearly nonsense. Even if you look at human milk, how much calcium does it contain, you can see that even the perfect food for babies really only has a middling amount of calcium. Slightly less than mandarin oranges. oranges. Blackberries, you know, Brazil nuts, everything we've been avoiding, and yogurt. 
it's very high in calcium. You can get enough calcium. So even if you think about where cows get their calcium from, where do cows get their calcium from? They have to put so much out in their milk for the calf, they get it from plants. They don't drink milk. <laughs> so clearly you can get enough calcium from your diet, from plant-based sources. So really, at the end of the day, you look at no-nonsense guidelines for calcium. So one, do not take calcium supplements. They actually could be very dangerous for you. The daily calcium intake of 500 milligrams per day is likely sufficient. So above that, you may actually run into more problems. Most of the calcium should be taken from vegetable sources. You should limit your dairy intake to one serving per day. And you should increase your physical activity. Basically, all the evidence across all these many decades points to the exact same thing. All right, I'll take any questions. If there's any questions.